Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ, your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man, so shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity. One of those from whom people hid, hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was a chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes, we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shears. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny when he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people? A grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light and fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. In your justice, rescue me. 
Into your hands I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. For all my foes I am the object of reproach, a laughing stock to my neighbors and a dread to my friends. Those who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead. I am like a dish that is broken. trust is in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. Father, shine upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be stout-hearted, all you who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord.
Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had his sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into a scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Did I see the of him? Again Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, At this Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and touch him according to your law. The Jews answered him, 
In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. You want me to release to you the king of the Jews. They cried out again, Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify, crucify. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, yeah, okay, but Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull in Hebrew, Gogotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also has an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, 
Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, in order that the, script, the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who, were, who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloth along with the spices according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
I was really struck this year by our passion narrative because it's not filled with most of the things that you would expect. We read the narrative of the passion and if you noticed, the first entire section of it is actually dedicated to the trial of Jesus, not to what we would consider his passion. Many of the events that occupy our imagination, that occupy our devotion, the crucifixion, for instance, is given a line, just one. It happens almost quietly and in the background. And I think there is a goodness to this, or at least it gives us a different perspective. All of the devotional things and the beautiful dedication we have to the passion and death of our Lord is a beautiful thing. But it's odd that so little of it is in the scriptures. And so I wanted to spend some time with you today with some of the characters that are in the scriptures, with some of the text of the Bible itself. Because I think what can get lost in the passion of Jesus is that we spend so much time with him and with these things. We've seen the passion of the Christ in that kind of moment that we miss some of what the scriptures themselves actually say. The first character that comes to the forefront is Judas. He's called Judas the Betrayer. Judas, famous Judas. Jesus is betrayed by a friend. He's betrayed by one of the twelve, by someone who he had chosen to be an apostle. And I find myself so often trying to fit Judas in somewhere. How did he do this? And why? It's like I find myself wanting to fix it, wanting to solve the problem somehow. Well, maybe he didn't know. Well, maybe he didn't understand. Maybe he thought something different. All of those are possible. It's true. But the terrible reality on the other side of it is that betrayal is easy. Sometimes it's convenient. Sometimes it's expedient. It's terrifying to look through your life and see the friends that you have turned on in a flash. The times where you knew saying something wasn't the right thing to do and then listened as the words came out of your mouth. It's amazing how easy and how often we fall into the same thing. We can look at Judas and point fingers and say, I, I'm not like that, I don't betray Jesus. And it feels like he could pull up his smartphone, his YouTube video of your life yesterday and show you, actually, look at this. You would see maybe for the first time, maybe in a way, how often, how simple, how easy it is. Now certainly that's not to say that we're all betraying Jesus every day in everything that we do. But I think of all of the things about Judas that is most troubling, I suspect he never expected it was him. I suspect that he always thought it could be one of the other apostles, but he was righteous, he was following the Lord, he had good reasons, he was on the right path. Something like that. One of the things that's very possible is he had disappointed expectations. He expected Jesus to be a Messiah, to ride into Jerusalem and be acclaimed as King and Lord, and to have the people bow down before him, because that was true. And it is true. And Jesus doesn't do it. When our expectations crash and burn, when we expect better of someone, when we have a standard that we set and we find people don't meet it or we don't meet it ourselves, that's when a lot of anger and harshness, that's when a lot of betrayal can happen very, very easily. They're the officers and the Pharisees. This is the next group of people that enters the scene. They march in, they're ready to arrest Jesus. 
But it's odd to think about what do they have against him? What has he actually done? What is his crime? Again, it's like we want to say that they're upset somehow, but it seems like part of it is that he's not the kind of Messiah they wanted. Their vision of the kingdom of God is different. They have rules and order and method about how God is supposed to act in the world and what he is supposed to do, and Jesus upsets everything. It seems like that's what they have against him. The words are so ringing and so resounding with problems. They don't want to defile themselves so that they can eat the Passover while they're condemning a man to death. Being defiled for eating the Passover is not as immoral, is not as wicked as murder. Think about that. And yet these soldiers, the most difficult part of them is that they're just just doing their job. The soldiers may not have even hated Jesus. They may be extras in the great drama that is playing out in front of them, but they were just doing their job. They came to work, they had families at home, whatever it was, they were doing their job and they were gonna go home. And they arrest an innocent man and condemn him to death. Think about how often, again, it's so easy to say, well, I was just following instructions. I was just doing what I was asked to do. Something a lot of us do far more often than we're comfortable with. They were just doing their job. They're harsh. They dehumanize Jesus. It's one of the only ways you can get through this. They have decided that his life is worth less than theirs. And so they act how they do. And the high priest is another character who comes into the scene shortly after this. The high priest, who should be the leader of the Jewish people. He should be the one leading the prayers for Passover. And what is he doing? What is the high priest actually doing? The answer is he's playing politics. Everything that he says is absolutely political from the beginning to the end. Why should it be? Why should we let one man not die for the sins of the nation? He he says things. And you can see, like, he should be leading the prayers. He's supposed to be the one bowing down in repentance and being in the temple and offering the sacrifices. And he's got politics on his mind. He questions Jesus about his teaching and his doctrine, not because he's seeking to understand, not because he wants to know him, not because he wants salvation, but because he's looking for a reason to justify his own action, that they're going to condemn Jesus to death. I think that a high priest like this, he probably didn't start off as an evil man. He didn't get into this position because he wanted to be wicked. Maybe he wanted to be righteous. Maybe he thought he was on the right path. But day by day, compromise by compromise, the road to this moment is paved. He had given up on things. He had started to look at things not in the religious view, but in one of power, in one of authority. Again, you have in the high priest someone who has religious expectations. Jesus should look like a Pharisee. He should be concerned about tithing dill and mint and cumin. Not healing on the Sabbath. Not turning over the tables of the money changers. Not proclaiming a kingdom that doesn't involve Israel and this temple and our priesthood, our things. We see a high priest who says, this is not my religion. And to Christians, it sounds a lot. We claim the Old Testament that Jesus is the God that it's talking about the whole time, from the burning bush until this moment where Jesus is standing there, and before that and after, Jesus is the guy. This is God. But the Pharisee 
says that Jesus doesn't have a part. In the case of the high priest, he may have been a Sadducee. They conspire in this as well. But think about the wars and divisions in our own time. Think about the divisions in our heart and the divisions in our church. How easy it is to look at a group of people outside of us and say, not my religion, not my direction, not my thing, not the way that I think we should worship God. And what is so uncanny about the situation is that God is standing right in front of him. He can look him in the eyes and he misses the boat completely. He's another character. I think he invites us to look at our lives and think about how God speaks to us. How does God speak to us? Are our hearts open to things where the voice of God might be a surprise? To places where we're not looking for him? to ways where the apple cart of our religion and our ideas get upset. Because we might be like the high priest, looking for God at all kinds of other places and miss what he's doing right in front of our eyes. It's easy to be like him. The last character that I would spend some time with today is Pilate. Pontius Pilate, he's the Roman governor. He's in charge of the place. He's probably miserable. Israel was not the Bahamas. It's not Florida. It's not Texas. It's like the northern part of Alaska, where the only people who get sent there are the hopeless ones, the ones that Caesar doesn't like. And Pontius Pilate is in charge of it, and he's upset. And he knows that the Jews are scheming. He knows that they are plotting against this man. Maybe he has an inkling that Jesus is innocent, that these are trumped up charges. Pilate looks at things in a very different way. He wants to keep the peace. He doesn't want conflict. And again, does he set out to be an awful person? Does he set out to be remembered for this one deed which would mark his entire life? He doesn't remain as governor for very long. He gets sent back to Rome, and some stories talk about him being murdered by Caesar himself. It doesn't go well for him. But he wants to keep the peace. Bit by bit, he has lived in this place of compromise. He has walked on a path that brought him before Jesus. And he says some of, he has some of the right questions. He asked Jesus, so you are a king? The answer is yes, the king of the world. This is it. This is the one. So you have a kingdom? Yes. But it's not a kingdom of soldiers and swords. It's a kingdom of hearts. It's not a kingdom of land and sacrifices in a temple. It's a kingdom of love. It's a kingdom of communion. It's a very different kind of kingdom. And the answer, the tension in the story is that Jesus gets condemned for calling himself a king and setting himself up against Caesar when he explicitly declared that's not his intention. His kingdom is not of this world. It's not a threat. And they kill him anyway. And then Pilate asks one of the greatest questions that rings throughout the ages and rings into our very hearts today. This is stunning to think about. What is truth? What does it mean that something is true? That it is real? We live in an age where all of a sudden all of these things that we thought were settled, like DNA and biology, are all of a sudden being thrown into the wind. We live in an age that likes to rewrite the past and rewrite misdeeds out of history and yet commits them by turning toward them on the same day. What is truth? And again, the answer is in front of him. The answer is Jesus himself. I am the way and the truth and the life. He teaches us about humanity. 
teaches us about suffering. He teaches us about death. He teaches us about ourselves. He teaches us about God. He is truth. He is real. Pilate is almost saying, I can make the truth whatever I want it to be because I'm in charge and I have authority. It's my way. I'm the boss. And that's what he does. And then greater power and greater authority ends his life. That game that we can play and who's the boss and who's in charge and who has power. It doesn't work. These are people that are part of the passion narrative of Good Friday. And I don't like to do this, but it seems fitting on this day where Jesus dies to leave a homily like this without a good resolution. Sometimes we just have to sit with the people and the characters and the garbage and the sin. We have to see it for what it is because our sins crucified the Son of God. We want to escape from it. We want to move it and change it into something else, some way of making it easier because it's hard, because facing the junk isn't easy, because our role in the passion of Christ scares us. But it seems like on this day, I offer you these thoughts about some characters, and there are other ones, and there are beautiful ones, and there are disciples, and there's Mary, and there's John, and there are people who keep faith. But it's like until we see in our hearts the same attitudes, the same things that contributed to the passion of Jesus, we're not ready to bow down and ask for his forgiveness. We're not ready to recognize our need for a savior. We think that he's nice, that it could help us get over the finish line, but maybe we're almost there already. It's when we see the wickedness in our own hearts that we have to admit that salvation is something that we long for like oxygen, that we need like a beating heart, and that it's freely given to us out of love, not because we're good enough and not because we've got the right answer, not even because we admit that we're sorry, but because of who God is and his desire that he could share his life with us. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her, and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God, the Almighty Father. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord who chose him for the order of bishop may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us kneel. Let us stand. 
hand. Almighty, ever living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their Maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop John, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace, all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for catechumens that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of catechumens that, reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the members of your adopted children. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly in the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, 
may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the science of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and the freedom of religion may, through your gift, be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because of their hour of need. Your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to go ahead and be seated. At this time, a collection will be taken up, a collection annually as ours taken up on Good Friday for the Holy Land, for the Franciscans that take care of the holy sites there. So I invite you to be generous. We 
At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may always be free from your sin and safe from all distress as we wait the blessed hope in the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessings, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son. In the hope of their resurrection, may pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. Through Christ our Lord.
she's not here today. She had to work. So. 